Now, in both of these books, specifically Beyond the Spores, oh, well, both of them actually, the information that I'm going to give you in this lecture is, is you know, just about scratches the surface. And if you think about that the information in the books doesn't even scratch the surface of what's out there, then you can understand that it was a very hard task to channel this information. And um, one thing I have noticed as I've moved on through working with the source entity and the origin, the, the absolute, the, that entity which created the source entities, is that the more, and I think Dolores has also experienced this as well, the more you work with them, the more you get used to the information, the more information they give you later. So you're able to work with more detailed information and understand more, more um, complicated concepts. And that's certainly been the case in part two, but uh, we'll go through some of that anyway. So in this instance, I want to go through the history of God, just a little bit over my awakening process and how I've um, come to be in the position I have in terms of working with the variously high level frequency entities. Um, I'm going to just to discuss three, three or four of those very, very briefly. Uh, the first one I contacted, which is Byron. Hum, who was a, a guide given to me by the arm to help my hand energetically as I moved up the, the higher frequencies. And then I want to go through a short history of the origin and the source entity, just to give you an idea of what's, what's out there. And uh, some understanding of, the, of spiritual physics and the source entity's multiverse, together with an illustration of how dimensions are overlaid. Then I want to go through an ascension to the frequencies to just to give you an idea of how mankind and other entities ascend to the frequencies and how you can use the undulations that occur within different frequency bands as a leg up into the next frequency and how when we come down the frequencies to incarnate in the physical body that we call mankind, we do lose an awful lot of our communication. And uh, very, very quickly at the end, I want to just go over again why we're here and, and, and the importance of the earth. And then I want to move into, into book two. Um, and go over in some limited detail what the source entities are and the functional maintenance of a source entity because there's 11 aspects that the source entity has to work with to make sure it's, it reduces its own functionality. And then I'm going to go through a microcosm of the information that I received from source entities 1 through 6, illustrating one of their environments and, and one of their entities. And then I want to do a little peek show at the end just to give you some information, a bit of a taster of what's in book two. So this is the, sort of the highlights from the history of God and my awakening. Now, throughout my young life, I, my young life, I'm now 51, I've been very interested in metaphysics and uh, certainly my late teens, early to late teens, I was investigating the greater reality an awful lot. I was reading a lot of metaphysical books of the day and meditating extensively. And in one of my meditations, one of my morning meditations, I was confronted by four individuals in white robes who smiled to me benignly, lovingly, all-encompassingly, and told me that what I was doing was right, but it's not the right time to do it right now. You need to get some more earthly experience. And then from that point onwards, oh, it's just gone there. Oh, okay. Okay. So I got confused then. Got two screens up here. You can't, you can only see one up there. Um, from that point onwards, I really put my metaphysical stuff on the back burner and concentrated on what we do normally in, in the physical. I met my beautiful wife, Anne. We got married. We bought a house in the country. I worked hard. We uh, bought other things, <laughs> got lots of cats. Um, I went through uh, an education process that was outside of work. So I, was, I did correspondence courses uh, within universities and got two master's degrees and became a chartered engineer and subsequently rose to the management ranks at work. College friends on one of the management courses said she was going to go to a Reiki session and was I interested? So I thought, hmm, yeah, I'll, I'll, I can handle this, I'll, I'll have a look. Twelve months later, I popped out the other side as a Reiki master. Almost synchronicitous to this, was within, within a few months of this, I was going to see an energy healer who was a first generation student of Barbara Brennan. For those of you who know Barbara Brennan, she did Hands of Light and Light Emerging and another book as well since then. And she said that she was starting to do a workshop to teach that which she was taught by Barbara Brennan and um, some of the work that was done by John and Eva Piriakos and Susan and Donovan Tasenga. And would I be interested? So I went to a weekend, uh, something similar to this, and I did some of the work there and I was hooked and 
signed up for a four-year commitment that involved lots of um, therapy from, on myself. I had to go and uh, receive psychotherapy to make sure I was clean to work with the energies because we don't want to pass on any, any r rubbish. So I went and did that. Four years later, I became qualified. Part of that included channeling, past life healing, and understanding a lot of the um, detail around the human body and the, the aura. But within a few, whilst I was doing this, another friend of mine who was a Reiki person went to go and work in Sweden. And he was told by his, his, um, his Reiki master that if we went over there on a holiday, we went over on a cheap holiday, so, you know, we stayed with him in, the, in his house, that I would be attuned um, to, to receive different things. And um, on that Swedish holiday, you can see this picture here, this is where we went, we went to on a walk. And there was a rock in the centre of this uh, area here, this, you can see the mouse working, okay, good, which was where I received my attunement. And uh, my, my friend and my wife, Anne, stayed on this suspension bridge here, and they both felt that there was an alien presence there, an energetic presence, and they were rewiring me to be able to work with different energies and work with different frequencies and entities. That attunement almost blew me away. I couldn't speak three words all day. I couldn't speak five words for the rest of the, rest of the, rest of the week, basically. And thinking about it now locks me up. So it was very, very difficult for me to, to accept what was going on. But what happened after that was quite remarkable. Because as I was working with the Brennan-based uh, healing science lecture, uh, lectures and work that my energy teacher was teaching me, Helen Stutt, I started to do things that I shouldn't be able to do. Now, we had to learn to traverse the lower frequencies to affect healing and repair work on the various parts of the auric layers and the chakras. So we had to move up and down the frequencies. And we were told there were seven frequency levels, each one associated with a chakra and subsequently associated with a, a level of the human aura. But I found out I could go higher than that, well, twice as high actually at that point in time, and I got reprimanded quite severely by my teacher for that. I was, wasn't grounded, it was going too high, it was causing a problem. But what I discovered was that there wasn't actually seven levels associated with the human form, there was ten. The first three were the same, they were associated with the physical side, but rather than having one level associated with the spiritual physical, what we know as the astral, there was four. And there was three above that that were associated with the purely energetic. I also noticed that our physical environment, our physical universe, is held within 12 frequency bands. And when I moved above that, I noticed I went into different universes. And I went into the 13th and 14th. And those 13th and 14th levels were associated with those first frequency bands of the next full dimension. And I can explain that in some detail later. But moreover, when I moved up past the 14th level, I started to get in contact with other spiritual entities. So the first entity I was in contact with was Byron, who initially tried to frighten me off, and that was on the 27th level. And I also met a group of aliens who were on a base around some of the hills in Crete, Greece, who told me that they were there to experience the difference, the, the, the dichotomy, the duality between the older Greeks and the younger Greeks. The older Greeks working with the land and working with animals and working with the, the, the trees and the, and the crops, whereas the younger Greeks were more interested in the materialistic side of life. So they, they were interested in that dichotomy there. But I also met other entities, entities called the Om, who were created by that residual energy that was used by the origin during its, one of its first experiments in becoming self-aware and experiencing learning and evolving. And Hum, that entity within the Om, held my hand as I went higher and higher up the frequencies. And eventually, when I got past level 100, I encountered a larger entity who very slowly told me that it was our source entity, that entity, that is our God. And I went higher. And I eventually went out of that multiverse, that multiverse that is God, and when he got in contact with that entity that created our God, that entity that is in the Hindu text called the Absolute, but which announced itself to me as the origin. So a little bit of history about the origin. The origin is the absolute, it is everything. It's got structure, it's got a number of zones, 12 of them, 12, 12 full dimensions, 12 full frequencies. I've since recognized it's got other things like planes, 
event space and all sorts of other universal, multiversal, omniversal um, materials that are used to construct it. And it told me how the universe, or, that, or the multiverse that was it, or the omniverse that's it, was constructed. And it said that it had these zones and that they, each of them could be, potentially be a, a, a universe in its own right. Now, when it became self-aware, the origin being a vast tract of space in NGG, became aware as a small part of itself because it needed to have a certain mass of energy with the right type of energy mixed together to start to give itself sentience and self-awareness. It started to experiment, started to experience, learn, and gain evolutionary content, which it desired. To accelerate this, this, this experience, it tried to, to create 12 of itself outside of its sphere of self-awareness that, that, it, that it, it had understood and generated. But that failed. And I've since found out the reason why it failed is that the absolute cannot create that which is the absolute. That's it. The absolute is the absolute. It can't recreate it. So it regathered in the energy and created a new strategy. And that strategy was to create 12 source entities, lesser beings to itself, within its own area of self-awareness, given intelligence, and be allowed to become self-aware in their own right, and given the, a single job to go out there, to experience, learn and evolve, pass that evolution back to itself in any way it can. Now our source entity, our God, is one of those such entities. It's a singular energy source, multi-frequential, multi-dimensional, given individuality and given the opportunity to become sentient, which it did. Once it became self-aware, it was educated by the origin, and the origin said that you've got one thing to do, is go out there and evolve, and pass it back to myself. It doesn't matter how you do it, just do it. And in doing so, it created this multiverse, which is a, uh, a simulacrum of that which is part of the origin. And it populated with smaller versions of itself, smaller individualized units of itself, and that's what we are. Now, the source entity created this multiverse, and I totally understand that this is a, <laughs> a very busy slide, but in essence, what we are in our physical environment is this bottom bit here. We are in the first full dimension, which is constructed of three sub-dimensional components, what we recognize as the three-dimensional universe. Above that, every frequency band that's associated with a sub-dimensional component is a universe in its own right. And for those of you who are doing the workshops tomorrow, this will be explained in much more detail. So don't worry too much if, about this. It's also going to be explained in much, de much more detail um, as part of the, the second book uh, from Beyond the Source Part 2. But if anybody wants to get a PDF version of this that explains it a bit further, let me know. Uh, leave an email with, um, with Nancy or the guys in reception and I'll send you a PDF to explain it. Simplistically though, our universe is a composite of three sub-dimensional components, which are inflated by 12 frequency bands, all creating a single universe. That's because the physical universe is constructed at the lowest frequencies possible. That's basically giving it a basement, okay? A foundation to work with. As you move up past that, each sub-dimensional component is separated, and each sub-dimensional component is inflated by 12 frequency bands in their own, and each frequency band creates a simultaneous universe in its own right, which is populated by whatever's there, other planets, galaxies, etc., or not as the case may be, and other entities. Now, one of the questions I asked the source entity was, how can all of these dimensions exist in the same space? Because it's, it's difficult, you know, how can mankind understand that? And he said, well, I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example of that which you use yourself to use the same space. And it explained that all of these things could exist in the same space by something that we call multiplexing. Now, when we create radio waves, we create a, this line here is a, a carrier wave. We use a carrier wave and we project onto that carrier wave a frequency band. And we can change the phase angle of that frequency band to allow us to project many different transmissions on the same carrier wave. That's how we work with AM and FM. That's how we work with medium wave and long wave. That's how we can have all of the radio stations on long wave, all the radio stations on medium wave, and none of them interfere with each other. So another example of this is to look in this direction here, with this, this oval circle, okay? And if we 
look at this and think, okay, the center point you can see growing is the first dimension. If we change the phase angle when we multiplex radio waves, we, we, we allow that area, that space to be used again in, in a fresh sense and transmit more information in, in a complete sense as well. So in, in this instance, we can use multiplexing as a good example of how the source entity has allowed us to have dimensions all within the same space. And this is a nice picture to show just how if we use those sine waves equaling a different uh, frequency band, or sorry, a different dimension, that it would all look together. Okay, now part of our ascension process, part of our progression, is based upon evolution. But we can only evolve by moving through the frequencies. So to allow us to evolve and ascend, we need to work with that which, give, which is presented to us in these different frequencies. So in essence, before an entity can translate to the next dimension, it must be able to translate or ascend the frequencies that fill the dimension of domicile, i.e. ascend. And this is an example of three-dimensional frequency space. Uh, this is actually a sound wave um, uh, image, but it does the same job. And we've got this line here, okay? You see that line there with my mouse? It's just visible. That's the, the mid, midpoint of that frequency band. And we have a tolerance above and below it. And these high points here would represent those entities who, within that, that universe, that simultaneous universe represented by this frequency space, are evolving, whether they're doing good things, you know, how high is their frequency, how close are they to evolving into the next level of frequency. Whereas these bottom ones <laughs> are where entities aren't doing so well. These other areas here, these little undulations, are where there's you know, good and bad being done, it's just about being held in the, in the, in the, in the nominal area. But if I turn that round into a two-dimensional image and show more than one frequency band, because there's high, high and low lows above and below, in, in, in above and below frequencies, you can see that here it's possible for an entity who's in a higher part of a lower frequency to ascend into the lower part of the higher frequency and therefore evolve as a process in the, in the process. So this is how an entity can evolve upwards. Entities can also use constructs, mechanical constructs or energetic constructs to move from one point to another point. But these points move around. They're like a sea, like the surface of the sea. They move up and down, they, they undulate. So nothing is really kept in the same place at any one time. So any entity that uses this and doesn't want to and wants to come back, you've got to make sure that you've got a construct or something to help you come back. Any entity that's ready to evolve, there's no problem at all. Now, when we work with the lower frequencies and become incarnate in the physical vehicle we call mankind, we do this to experience things in a most harsh way. We experience the lowest frequencies by being part of those lower frequencies and working with those lower frequencies in the only way we can. So we project part of ourselves into, in essence, this physical body to experiences. And in doing so, a couple of things happen. In essence, we lose a lot of that which we are in terms of our communication. We are cut off. We also enter into a contract to say that we will work with the physical in the most holistic way, i.e. without any knowledge of that which we are when we're energetic. So we enter into this contract. And what happens is, if we recognize ourselves as being the world wide web, the energy in the world wide web, and that which we are when we're projected into the physical body is equal to that which is contained in a PC, and therefore our communication process is reduced accordingly, you can see why actually, because a PC can't access everything on the World Wide Web, it would crash. That's why we can't access everything that's part of ourselves. When we're in the physical body, we would crash. Oh, and by the way, we're only as good as our search engine. We're only as good as our medium. <laughs> so when you ask questions of your medium, make sure they're good questions. <laughs> Okay, so the basics of why we're here. And I've touched upon this uh, in some, some limited detail. So the source entity created us as smaller versions of itself to go down and get dirty and experience those small areas that it can't possibly experience itself. If you can imagine as a human, you can't possibly experience the microbes that are embedded within the surface of your hand. You can't see them. And in a similar sense, the source entity can't experience that which is in its lower frequencies itself. So it created 
multiple versions of itself to go down and experience those small areas. So the objective for us is to go down there, experience everything, learn from everything, and subsequently evolve from everything, and pass that evolutionary content back on to the source entity. We don't, leave it, we don't lose the evolutionary content ourselves, we simply pass it on. That content is then passed on automatically to the origin, who also subsequently evolves. One of the cherries on the cake, as it were, is that when we're evolving, if we evolve whilst we're suddenly physical, we start to become self-realized. We start to become aware of what we are. And for those of you here who are becoming self-aware and starting to contact the greater reality, you'll understand that. I know there's certain individuals here, like Michael Dennis, for instance, okay, and some of the other uh, psychics here, who are picking up information of a, of a, of a, a more detailed quantity. That's because they're starting to evolve and rise to the frequencies, as the, as, as the case may be. And that is, that's the icing on the cake. And all of this helps to facilitate the ascension of the universe via the Earth's ascension. And I'll just explain that a little bit more. So the Earth is an experiment in free will, and it's designed to help accelerate evolution. By having individualized free will, we can do whatever we want, in any way we want to do it, as long as we're prepared to pay the consequences. Karma. <laughs> okay? But if free will is successful, and it will be, the Earth will ascend as a result of our own ascension process. And free will will be adopted throughout the universe. And that will ensure that the universe will also ascend. And therefore, we'll move up into this 13th frequency level, this next dimensional condition. And where we are now, we'll just shut off. There'll be no need for it anymore, because we'll have moved past and beyond that. So basically, the Earth is pivotal in the ascension process of the universe, and we are pivotal in the ascension process of the Earth. So that draws me to moving on from the history of God, and I thank you for listening to this again if you listened to it last year. The book contains much more detail, clearly, and, um, and clearly the Beyond the Source contains much more detail. But it was clear that when I was working with the source entity, and the origin, that I would need to move beyond that which was our source sensitive multiverse to try to capture in some small way and pass it on to mankind that which is beyond our God. There are many yogis who have hundreds of years ago said to their students, don't get happy, don't get confident, don't get complacent when you're meditating. When you reach the God state, Move on. See what's beyond God. And that is what our role is. So in this book now, I'm going to just illustrate just some of the, the things that we would understand as mankind as being, pre you know, as being prevalent and being manufactured within this, uh, this greater reality that includes the other 11 source entities. And beyond the source covers the first six source entities. So I'm going to go over what the source entities are and what the functional maintenance of a source entity is, what it needs to do to maintain its own existence. Because they've got to look after themselves, they've got to groom themselves, as it were, comb themselves, make sure they're in good condition. And then I'm going to look at source entities 7 through 12, just to let you see what's coming next. And this is a very brief overview, by the way. Ah, in these images, in these little sketches there, that are there, it's wonderful pieces of artwork, okay? The scaling is nowhere near right. It's just a conceptual illustration. So please don't think that um, when you get to the pictures of me, you, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not that big, <laughs> clearly. So uh, just to recap on the source sentences and give it a bit more life. The source sentences were created by the origin, what the Hindu texts call the absolute. All there is to help it investigate itself and evolve in the process. And their task was to experience, learn, and evolve. Anybody who speaks with me will hear me talk about experience, learning, and evolve an awful lot. Those are three key words. And the way they had to do this was up to them. They just needed to just do it. Some created multiversal environments as a workshop for this work. Some populated those multiversal environments with smaller individualized versions of themselves to experience that fine detail of their environments 
which they would find difficult to understand and work with in their own state. In essence, the source entities are the co-creators. They are what are really the Elohim. And they are the method of the origin's acceleration of its own evolution. And uh, this, this image here actually is from book two. Uh, it's towards the back end of the book, actually. And this just gives you an idea, a little conceptual idea of some of the images that uh, were, were picked up by myself when I was talking to these entities. And uh, each of these represents a source entity. And at this point in time that I draw this, I was in contact with the origin, source entity 10, source entity 11, and source entity 12 concurrently. Multiplexing that amount of information concurrently was very hard work, and I almost crashed and burned. And I had to, to prioritise the information, how it came through. And as you can see in this instance here, source entity 10 was just pulling away. So, uh, and again, this, the scaling is not correct in this instance. But it was very interesting times doing this. <laughs> so, the functional maintenance of a source entity was given to me by source entity 4. And I'll read this out to you. They have 11 areas they have to maintain. The first is structure. The structure of a source entity is independent and interconnected with its form and its volume, irrespective of its energy or type. Its form is what source entities choose to maximize the number of environments that they can create and do create. And the volume is how source entities choose to inflate themselves in order to accommodate the environments and the entities they create, whilst detail is that which is being investigated by every source entity and the origin. Self is that function of a source entity that is. It is a result of the co correct and harmonious operation of detail and being. Self is what all source entities investigate at the start of their existence. They have to become self-aware under their own steam. Remembrance is the way that source entities continue to know who and what they are and what they've achieved, irrespective of what they've done. And you'll see with source entity five why that's necessary. Compartmentalization is what source entities do when they create an environment. It allows their normal functionality to operate without the need to maintain the environment that has been compartmentalized. That means they create areas for us to work in and they can still maintain their individuality. And singularity is a function of being in detail, which is what keeps source entities autonomous from the origin. Source, source entities are responsible for themselves and their creations. The origin is not. Diversification is a function of their ability to, uh, to experiment into the different ways of evolving and using these ways in parallel to accelerate their total evolution. Whereas multiplicity is a higher function of singularity and diversification, and it is the ability to do many, many things all at the same time, to touch all of those thousands and thousands of plates and keep them spinning. This is omnipresence. This is what they do. They know and can communicate with every, everything and everyone and every entity they have created concurrently. And finally, being is a result of the combined functions of detail, self, and singularity. It is a higher function of self whilst being separate and independent. So a bit more information about our source entity. Okay. And this little sketch up here is just to show it's got a, a bit of structure to it. So source entity one is the creator of our multiverse. And source entity one allows extended creativity. And that means that we get creation created by that which is created. So we are created by our source entity, and we, yet we are allowed to create as well. That's a wonderful gift. The multiverse itself is ascension in action. Okay? It's a, a habitat that's been provided to allow us a structured method of moving up the frequencies and return back to our source in communion with our source. And the physical universe provides the foundation for the multiverse. It provides a location for the lowest frequencies experienced by the origin, but placed within that structure that our source entity has created. The galaxies, by the way, within the universe are entities within their own right. Their primary role is to gather all the stray energy that's within the, within the universe and give it purpose, to collapse the energy, to, give it, to make it solid, to get, make areas of locally low density, and to provide some steps for the evolution of in, individualized entities. 
Galaxies evolve as a result of their being of service to the individualized, individualized entities. Us. Okay? And they are the guardians of the space that they exist within. Now, those planets that they create are essentially the workforce of the galaxies. And they're there to provide a, a, a cleaning role in a, in, a most, in, a, in a most fine detail. So when you see meteorites hitting the Earth, it's not because they, they, they're naturally occurring and they've, they've, they've come and been sucked in by, the, um, by the, uh, the gravitational effects. Actually, the Earth's doing a role. It's removing some of the rubbish that's out there and keeping the area clean. It's also there to provide a focal point for the physical and energetic existence of smaller entities, such as ourselves. In this instance, they're there to help us experience, learn, and evolve on an area of locally low density. Of course, in result of this, Gaia, the name for our Earth that we know about, also evolves. So it is also evolving as a result of our work with it. The smaller entities such as ourselves, yeah, I've mentioned this many times, so I'm not going to go over it too, too much, are there to experience the minute detail. It's our job to get down and be dirty and experience, learn, and evolve everything from a very, very small perspective. We need also to recognize our position within the universe recognize the mission of our existence, understand where we come from, understand that we're part of the, the origin and the source entity, and return to the source when appropriate. And be part of the maintenance of oneness whilst in the whole and the source. Now, source entity two divided itself up into four main universal environments. And it's got structure as well. Now, the first environment housed 10,000 entities that had been given source entity levels of power. And they had total power over their, over their environment. But they could only exist within that environment. Okay? They couldn't return to their source. They were all one and the same, and they were only distinguishable by their thought processes. And they existed like a cloud, as an undulating mass forming droplets of sentience. And when a job was needed to be, to be done, to allow this evolutionary process to happen. Little droplets of sentience would be formed and they'd drop down and move into that which they needed to do. Do the role and then return back into the, the cloud. Environment two involved a completely different set of entities and they used something called the cast out principle to exist and evolve. They were limited to one dimension and one base frequency only, fairly similar to ourselves within the physical universe. And they had to exist as a multiple. So for every one of us, there would be four of them. Now, they existed and worked within a group. But whenever any of that group evolved adversely to the group, either positively or negatively, that entity was cast out of the group. And they were asked to go and find a group that is consistent with their own evolutionary content, either higher or lower, or create a new group. So in that sense, they can form many groups of cast-outs. In the third environment, that was an environment for change. And by that, I mean it was fluidic in nature. It was constantly changing in something that was called rotational attractivity. Everything had a force called rotational attractivity. It's not gravity, but it's the random function that causes an entity to slip uncontrollably from one dimensional frequency to another. Now, the entities within this environment knew that they were being pulled from one specific frequency or dimension into another one. And they knew that they got to prepare themselves for it. So by the time they went into that new frequency or dimension, they could work with that frequency dimension. They could hit the ground running, so to speak. Now, environment four was an environment aware of its own existence. It was given the gift of individuality and given the opportunity to evolve in its own right. It was energy given sentience. As it evolved, it created its own entities it was give, and gave them the same rule as all other source entities. The environment itself is purely energetic, though, and that basis of the, of the environment was used as a, as a communication medium. The entities that were there as part of that environment were like gases mixing together, but not in the way that we know and that creates a gas, but they were very, very fine in their detail. Source entity two considered itself to be like a matrix sphere. 
And the entities that worked on source entity 3's environments existed in the higher frequencies, only in the higher frequencies. And I've put up there, it's blissful. It was blissful. It was like being in total joy, total communion all the time. The entities themselves were similar to what we call nature spirits on Earth. And they existed only as long as it was necessary for them to perform their role and then return to their core energies. So they were transient in their existence. However, whilst they were, they were in existence, they could create constructs or areas of local density to help each other evolve. They could also create non-sentient individualized beings made of energy available from the outside environment to help them evolve as well. And those entities would evolve and do roles to help them evolve for that entity that has created them. That would allow that entity to go out and duplicate itself or work with other entities and evolve in a different way. So there was lots of um, convoluted methodologies of uh, evolving there. Now they used something called creative intention. So the areas of local, local density, planets if you want to call it that, were created by the creating entity's creative intention. And those areas of local density, whether you want to call them planets or galaxies, could be as large or as small as required. So a planet could be, in effect, as large as a galaxy, and a galaxy could be as large as a small moon. Now, they needed to create entities to maintain that intention. Otherwise, it would dissolve. So they had to have maintenance entities there. And actually, that's pretty similar to what our source entities got, because those entities that we know as major spirits, they're maintenance entities, and they, they maintain that which is part of the Earth. And that allowed those entities to go out and experience something else and evolve in a different way as well. And those energies that were used to create the, the area of local density, the planets, and those other entities, those maintenance entities, could, at the right point in time, be regathered and reused and used for something else. And there's a little um, image there of what I was told was a maintenance entity. And I can't, for the life of me, describe exactly why that image was given to me, apart from the fact it was, it was, it's got a multifunctional um, way, of, way of working. Now, source entity four was a source entity of energy voids. And it's said to me that the position of the energy voids creates energy flow, and that flow creates function. So those parts that provide the structure need energy flow to allow the function to operate. So the environments created allow the entities to exist in physical levels of frequency much higher than those associated with mankind's physicality. So that which you call physical now, and this is rock solid, for instance, isn't specifically also what physicality is counted on later. So we can still rise to the frequencies and still be physical. Now, one of the universes within this source entity's environment was similar in form to a donut, and the images of the planets that I saw there were the same as well. Within that donut-shaped planet, there was three environments. There was the environment in the middle of the donut, on top of the donut, and within the below the surface of the donut. And Within the central void of the donut, there were entities there that were like huge, vast butterflies with great big wings that were used as energy accumulators. And that allowed those entities the opportunity to take the energy and move forwards, going through lines of attractivity, going from one place to another place. On the surface of the planet, that demanded a heavier version. So those wings were a bit smaller. Okay? They allowed them to use different energies. And it also allowed other appendages to become visible to allow them to work with different energies and you know, move around the surface if they were required to do so. Under the surface was a different matter, but the under the surface was sort of similar to us, the difference between us being in the air compared to being underwater. So again, there was another entity there that had an even smaller version of the wings that allowed it to move around. This entity had a force field around it that allowed it to move through the, the density that was below the surface in an unhindered way. And um, I was given this image here, which um, took me quite by surprise, actually, and it said that it would be like the surf this form would be like crossing the surface-based form of the entity, which I didn't see, 
with a crab or a crayfish with significantly less density. So you can see butterfly wings there with a, a crayfish type design there. So it's, they're quite bizarre the entities in these different environments. But interestingly enough, these entities in the middle of the donut, on top of the surface and inside, could change their forms so that they could experience the different types of the, of the environments of those planets. Now, in another part of Source Sensitive 4's environment, some of the entities could associate themselves with planets to work with. And they would work with the needs of that planet. And one planet type has a function being sort of specific to being like in a community of planets. So the entities worked with those, those, those planets and moved them around the local galaxy, positioning them together so that they would click together uh, a bit like a stickle brick or Lego land, as you want to call it that. And there was, no, so, there was no end to how many of these planets could stick together. They were all designed to work together. Moving on to Source Sensitive 5, Source Sensitive 5 was a singular source entity. It had decided to stay on its own and not create a multiverse. The Source Sensitive 5 described its first contact with the origin and it said, it was like an energy tube linking the origin with itself, what appeared to be a skin that surrounded it. And this tube changed in appearance as the communication progressed. And the way I saw this was a bit like a tornado. If you imagine a tornado contacting another sort of amorphous object, it was a bit like that. And it said communication on this level was instantaneous, complete and concise. And it was actually like being the origin. You instantaneously knew everything about the origin, about its environment, what it was, how much of itself it knew, what the other source entities that become self-aware and the created knew, and, how, and what they were working with themselves. So it became instantaneously educated. And it said that the source entities are individualized units of the origin in plane, dimension, and energy. And um, this image here is one that I've generated that, and again, it's not to scale, but it gives you the idea of the little tornado effects here that are in, in contact with and communicating with and educating the source entities as they become self-aware. In this instance, this one's just pulled away and these three source entities are being educated. Now, Source Entity 5 elaborated further on why it decided to stay singular. And it said, I, I decided to do create things for myself within myself and only that which was necessary for my own evolution and expansion of my own knowledge. And it thought that doing that was enough to sustain itself. It was enough to maintain its own position and its own continued existence. Now, Source Sensitive 5 experiments on itself, and as a result of that, some of those experiments can result in it losing control of itself. So it decided to put a, almost a timer function on itself so that when it got to a point of losing control totally, it didn't matter, because at some point that experiment would click, stop, and then reset. But all throughout this area of loss of self-control, there was a part of Source Entity 5 that was still cognizant and recording everything that was there. It was experiencing, learning, and evolving from that which was created, that which was chaotic, if, if you want to call it that. Source Entity 5 told me that in one of its experiments, the dimensions themselves gained sentience. They were intelligence without the need for frequency and energetic content. He created a new material. He said that the dimension is a higher form of existence and therefore sentience. And he explained to me later that the reason why this can happen is because dimension is a higher function of the origin's makeup. And that is why dimension can be sentient in its own right. So in doing this, it dis discovered that parts of the origin can become sentient on its own right without the need of having the frequencies to, and, the, and the energies to bulk it all up and give it this, this critical mass it needs. Now, finally, within Beyond the Source, book one, we talk about Source Entity 6. And Source Entity 6 was a Source Entity of five aspects. It created five levels of existence within itself. There were no dimensions or frequencies, it was just five levels of existence. But it also created a group of entities to e exist, to experience, learn and evolve within that, that environment. That were these levels of existence. 
And he said that level one was the level of basic existence and understanding of self and sentience, which led on to level two, which is the level of self-realization and the awareness of Source Entity 60's greater reality. And that level three is the level of creativity, whilst level four is the recognition of creativity for evolutionary purposes, working with level three. But level five is a level of evolutionary experience through self-denial. Self-denial being the, the ultimate sacrifice, only one entity to date had achieved that level. In fact, I found out later that that entity provided the environment for the other four levels to work within, so it was giving itself up for the other entities to exist within. But interestingly enough, in the other four levels, the entities don't need to experience these, these levels in... Um, in logical order, in level one, level two, level three, level four. They can do them in any random order totally. And they can do this singly or by, by duplicating themselves. Now, Source Entity 6 went to great lengths to describe one of these entities. And they looked like dark, multi-layered entities with streamers of dark energies animating from them. They were like great big amorphous black holes, but with form. Their interior, which was visible, was the exterior, which was the interior, which was everything. Everything was totally confused. There was, everything was one and the same. It was completely confusing. It left me on my back for quite some time trying to understand what was going on. These entities appeared to be interconnected in all ways. And they had portals or mini doorways that allowed energies and parts of the form to experience and to, and to work and to move around themselves. But more importantly, it allowed the entities to exist within each other in the most interesting way. So it didn't only exist in different levels, but it was designed to function in these levels and each other all at the same time. And as a result of this, the function and form wasn't really form, it was pure function. So these entities were pure function. And uh, this was a, an image of one of those entities. And you can see here, they're all the same entity, and the, these little stars here show the different uh, energies moving backwards and forwards. And this particular entity here, if you can see it okay, uh, it's probably difficult for you guys to see from there, but this entity here is existing within this entity. And that entity is existing within that entity. But this entity is also existing within that entity, with that entity existing within that entity. So it was all very confusing and convoluted and very difficult for me to get my um, limited intellect around. So this exists not only on a universal scale, but a micro-universal scale as well, and in a subatomic scale, down past towards the a new level that I talked about on Friday. So they can be as big as or as small as they need to be, convoluted, introverted, inside, outside, completely different way of existing, completely convoluted way of existing. Now that finished uh, book one, and I was encouraged to start book two immediately, and I was encouraged to increase the word content of book two immediately in terms of how much time, in terms of hours of channeling it took to create book two. Hence, the opportunity to present it uh, during this weekend. So I'm going to give you a quick, quick look-see as to what these other entities are. Now, you probably can't see this very well because of the... Um, Oh, that's better. Okay, you can see that's okay. Source Entity 7 initially decided to split itself into two. But halfway through the process, it realized that in the process of giving itself two levels of individuality, it gave itself a third level of individuality. So it decided to stay in that, that third level of individuality and stay in this sort of semi-separated state. Each of those... In uh, parts of Source Entity 7, which uh, called themselves Source Entity 7A, 7B and 7C, had their own multiversal structures, had their own entities to fill them. But those entities were allowed to travel between those different Source Entity environments in the most convoluted way, as you can imagine. Source Entity 8 started to test my ability to understand. It is a continuum of continuum. And it told me that the plural of continuum is continuum, no matter what mankind says. Each continuum is affected by evolution. And each continuum can affect each other, each other 
in, in an evolutionary sense as well. And it said that we're all linked together by a loci, and the centre point is the loci of the loci. And within that, we move around each other, changing our form and our shape, depending upon our evolutionary content. Source entity nine was a source entity whose entities were comprised of event space. Now, for those of you who've read the history of God, you'll recognize that event space is that space that we know and use and call parallel universes, where things happen concurrently. They're not, they're not simultaneous universes that are created by the structure of the multiverses, but they, they're those bits, those, those bits of duality that occur when we have a decision process to make. And that the entities within Source Entity 9 were basically created from event space. And during the dialogue, it gave me the additional components of event space. In fact, it gave me four additional components of event space. But it also gave me two new universal components as well that would be used to be able to understand how multiverses are created. Source Entity 10 started off by advising me on, on the fact that there were four different versions of these entities called the OM. And there was a, a hybrid OM, there was a, uh, a captive OM that was stayed between the, within the multiversal environment of a specific source entity. There was a non-captive OM that, was, that could exist just outside, and there was a pure OM. It also illustrated the 38 epochs of self-awareness that an entity might go through. And it described its own entities, and it said that these entities ex exist in three scales of environments on a random basis, and that these entities work in all three environments concurrently. So the entities can work in micro, macro, and mini universes all at the same time. Fairly similar to what happened in Source Entity 6, but in a, in a different way. Source Entity 11 made itself into a collective, totally. It lost its singularity and made itself into a collection of billions of different, like, different entities. And it tend, seemed to focus its, its work on computation of various different things, specifically the synergetic effects of being in a collective. And it identified that there was a certain level where being in a collective started to negate the synergetic effects. And whilst I was communicating with it, it was working on this in the background in another event space. And it eventually managed to circumnavigate this law of uh, collective synergy, and decided to reconstruct itself to maximize its potential as a result of circumnavigating this law. Now, for those of you who've read this, the history of God, you'll know that Source Sensitive 12 was a Source Sensitive that hadn't awoken. It was still dormant. It hadn't become self-realized and therefore hadn't started to contribute towards the origins um, evolutionary content. But I was told that wasn't specifically true. It had started to become self-aware and that the origin would take me to the event space to witness this, which I did. I also witnessed that period when the origin communicated with the uh, Source Sensitive 12 for its first time and educated it. Now, because Source Sensitive 12 was new, it hadn't started any strategies to evolve. And as a result of that, it hadn't been constrained by the commitments of, the, of evolution. So it decided to stay where it was. And it thought its peers, the other source senses, had, had covered all the evolutionary angles. So it decided instead not to do anything other than move outside the immediate area of the origins area of self-awareness. And it started the evolution of the, uh, the origin off early, basically. It, it kicked off the, the, the origins movement out into its area of self-awareness early. So that was quite something to witness. And then there's the origin itself. And this is a, just an example at the end of the presentation that shows, um, although the sphere of the origins area of self-awareness isn't specifically spherical, it's amorphous in shape. This gives you an idea of um, how the 12 source sensitives might look if they were within that. And actually, those source sensitives wouldn't be seeable. You wouldn't be able, they'd be too small to be seeable within the, uh, the area of the source sensitive area of self-awareness. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. Now, I, uh, I totally understand that you may find that a lot of the information within that is absolutely out of this world. And you'd be right. <laughs> it, uh, 
a lot of the information there was difficult to get a hold of, difficult to get a grip of, and it took me a lot of time to become aligned with the, with the, with the, with the energies and the frequencies. And uh, the second book, book two, was a, an even harder job. <laughs> Some questions and answers, I think, uh, Julia. Yes, how did you get in contact with these sources? Was it through meditation? And did you have to do anything special to, to get mm. there that far? Yeah. Um, initially, I had to go through a, quite a rigorous application of a meditative process uh, to get into a position where I could go through the frequencies and be in contact with these entities. But when I got to a point of being up there often enough, I, I established a permanent and substantial link with these entities and noticed that I didn't need to go through the rigor and the process of going through deep meditation. The link was there all of the time. So it became quite easy within our own source entities multiverse to enter into communion and communication with the source entity and, and the other um, entities. As I moved further away from our source entity to communicate with these other source entities, uh, initially I had my energetic hand held by our source entity because it would be diff completely different frequency sets. And in the, um, in, I think in the, the first chapter of uh, source entity two, I think I described the difference in frequencies is like my face being rubbed up against the bark of an oak tree, <laughs> which was, yeah, it was difficult to get my tip to work with. Yeah. But once, yeah, once I'm doing it, it's there. And actually, the workshops are teaching people to start to do that as well, to go through the rigor, and eventually, as you progress, you can then pre you know, move into just, just going there. Yes, sir? This is not really a question, but I assume there are ways of God knowing herself uh, that the more uh, the source energies are utilized, then God knows more and more experiences more and more. Correct, yeah. Okay, then my question is, and this, this is a question I've always pondered, what, what was the beginning? Can you explain what was happening at the beginning and then what happened before that? <laughs> How long have you got? <laughs> um, in the beginning was basically just a vast tract of space that, that was, wasn't sentience at all, it wasn't intelligence, it wasn't aware. Uh, and that vast tract of space was the origin, in effect, um, what the Hindus call the absolute. And that, for whatever reason, and whatever, whatever rhyme or reason, um, it's unexplained, but in essence, certain parts of energies coalesced together that attributed to being in a, in a critical mass situation. And those energies worked together and, and eventually became self-aware or sentient. They started to question what they were, what they were doing. And as, as the origin became more self-aware, it realized that as it was becoming more self-aware, things were happening around it. It was doing things and it started to generate things quite by accident. So it started to experiment with these things to try and experiment itself, trying to understand what itself was how big itself was, what it could do and how it could do it. But in all of this, it started to experience, learn and evolve, those three words. And it was this evolutionary content that really attracted it. Because as it evolved, it gained more understanding of self in an experiential perspective. And as a result, it desired to accelerate that evolutionary content as fast as possible. It wanted more, faster. So it created the source entities and gave them the opportunity to um, become self-aware in their, in their own way, rather like a baby does. It becomes self-aware and becomes aware of its environment and starts to see things and, and the brain starts to work out that that's a door and that's a wall and that's a light and that's the floor. They start to, and then starts to get educated and that sort of stuff. So in essence, it all started with the origin and the origin gave uh, itself the opportunity to evolve faster by creating these source entities, one of them being that entity we call God. So, so in the beginning there was movement? In, in essence it was a movement of energies, yes. It was almost like a coalescence of like energies that when they, when they came together, for whatever reason, started to gain some level of intelligence, self-awareness. There's a person. Oops, one over there as well. 
Uh, well, first of all, um, uh, just, just sort of a comment. Uh, we talk a lot about infinity. We, we toss the word around an awful lot, but it seems to me that you're the first person that's ever really tried to crack it. <laughs> Thank you. And, and look at it. Oh, I haven't cracked it yet, by the way. <laughs> uh, would, would you say that's a fair way to say it? Yes, yeah. Uh, and, and then to really get a sort of a grasp of how infinite it really is. <laughs> yeah. Well, in, in essence, that which is infinite, which we think is infinite, is actually finite. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, yeah we're just, yeah, it's... Uh, yeah, and that, 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 that being, if, if we classify our, our source centre as being infinite, that's finite in comparison to the origin. And the origin's area of self-awareness is finite in comparison to that which it hasn't discovered yet about itself. Now, my second uh, observation or question, kind of, is, like, it seems to me there's like sort of three ways that we, that we uh, get in touch with extraordinary experiences or information or whatever. One is through meditation, uh, another through some kind of drug experience of some sort, and, and then through just some uh, grace or, or whatever, just a mystical experience of some sort. And I wonder if you would comment on those various accesses to the infinite. Um, grace, ha I'll, I'll do it in reverse order. Grace happens as a result of um, evolutionary ascension. In essence, as we as a whole evolve, we increase the evolutionary content of, the, of, the, of, of mankind, we rise to the frequencies. As we rise to the frequencies, certain individuals who have been incarnated and have a higher evolutionary content start to access that which is part of the greater reality more easily than others. So it's not specifically grace, it's part of their own evolutionary content. In terms of using um, mechanical means, drugs, LSD, etc., what happens there is, is the, the, the physical body becomes so abhorrent to those energies that have been projected into the physical, then that, that energy that's been projected into the physical to experience, learn, and evolve through using the physical vehicle, get the hell out of there. But they also take the intellect with it, the, the, the conscious mind and the subconscious mind, so everything leaves. It's almost like dying. Yeah, it's almost like the physical body dying, but, but experiencing this... Um, out-of-body experience and this near-death experience. So when the body recovers and, the, and, the, and the, the, the drugs start to wash out and the body starts to calm down in its frequency, then the energies come back into it and those, those individuals come back into, their, into, into the body. The meditative process is simply, and I say simply, a method of removing the intellect from the physical universe. It's a way of shutting yourself off from the charade, the drama, of that which we think is reality, and moving into the greater reality. And to do that, we need to remove ourselves from all stimuli, and meditation does that. Okay. There's a lady over here. There's a lady over here as well. Yeah, okay. Uh, I have a question from the back. <laughs> Hi. When you were talking about frequencies existing in the same space, if you will, mm -hmm. um, if you consider source one and all of the frequencies associated with source one in the same space, were you also talking about the other 11 sources and what they created existing in the same? Uh -huh. In the instance of, the, of this presentation, no. That frequency space was based upon that which is only relevant to our multiverse. Okay. The other source centers have got their own way of doing things. and the. The opportunity to present what I could is, is not even giving it justice to what's out there, basically. But the book does go into some minor detail of what's, what's out there. We can't possibly understand it all in one go. We can't possibly understand what's in our own backyard. We, we don't know what animals live in there, what, what bacteria live there, what insects live there. We've got no idea. So if we can't understand our own backyard, or even, our, or even the back of our own hand, for instance, then we, we've got no chance of understanding the reality that is our... our our multiverse, that which is our, our God, and therefore we've got no chance of understanding what's really out there beyond God. But in essence, we've been given the opportunity through the work I've been doing to gain a snapshot, a little look through the crack in the door to understand what's there. Thank you. Thank you. There's a lady down here. Oh, do you want to wait a minute until I get to the microphone so it can be picked up on the... so the guys behind you can hear. Yeah. Thank you for being patient, thank you. 
Okay, the first question I have is, when you have the origin, and then you have the 12 sources within that origin, mm -hmm. um, are they just subsets of the origin, or do they take all of the origin so there's nothing really left of the origin because it's already been divided into 12 equal sources? Um, if, oh, I'm going to have difficulty driving. In essence, Does the origin um, retain an identity? Yes. With, but with parts of it gone, or parts of it working within it? Well, the, the, the origin retains its own identity, but it's, if you imagine that the origin is equal to the Earth, and the source entities are, it's in essence, 12 grains of sand. Okay, that's how that's, that's, is that, that's the origin. Yeah, 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 absolutely. They've, they've been created within that which is the origins area of self-awareness to experience, then evolve. But they are individualized units of the origin, but much, 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 much smaller. Just as when we are back in the energetic, that which is energetic mankind is individualized units, along with other entities, individualized units of the source entity. So we're all linked. If, actually, there's, a, there's a quite a nice hierarchy there. There's those entities that are created by a source entity, which belong to the source entity because they are part of the source entity. And there's those entities that are part of the, the other source entities, and they're part of their source entity. And then the source entities themselves are subsets of the origin. And is the origin itself also evolving, as well as just the, the 12 grains of sand? That's the whole point of creating those 12 grains of sand. The whole point of the origin creating the, the source entities was to accelerate its own evolutionary content faster than it can do on its own. Since we're a subset of one of those grains of sand, mm -hmm. okay, then when we die, we go to be with God on, on our source, whatever that is. Then is it uh, open to us then of what the origin is? And do we then understand the origin through death? You have to consider the bigger picture, and that bigger picture being that the physical body is just a motor car to us. If the soul is this, and the motor car is the physical body, then when the, when we've, when the uh, motor car dies, we don't lose our individuality. We, we continue with our individuality. So in essence, when the physical body dies, that energetic set that was used to drive the physical body returns back to that larger energy set, which is us, not the origin, us, okay? That content, that experience content that's been generated through, ex through existence on the physical is then taken back to that larger part of us and is then absorbed back into and amalgamated as one of a subset of memories and experiences. That information and the evolutionary content is also passed on to the source entity. We both keep it. We keep around evolutionary content, and so does, the, so does the source entity. But that also passes it on to the origin. So as we evolve, so does the source entity, and subsequently, so does the origin, which is evolving in its own way as well. <laughs> so, so in the end, we all become one, one again. The source entity loses the 12 the, sources. The, if we want to become one with the source entity at the end of our evolutionary um, role, if you want to call it that, because we've, we've got to roll through all the different frequency bands to, to, to understand and experience everything about the different simultaneous universes, then we can become one again with our God. We wouldn't lose our individuality, but we'd become a big subset of it rather than being an individualized unit of it. <laughs>